webinar and we'll be uh, at the end of the presentation there should be some time for us to uh, respond to some of those questions um, so go ahead and type those in but everyone will be muted during the presentation itself um, so welcome to the webinar uh, this is a webinar of the coastal resilience uh, California coastal resilience network um, and uh, one of a series we're looking forward to offering more and today's webinar is going to be on uh, Humboldt Bay adapting to extreme sea level rise um, the presenters today will be myself uh, Joel Gerwine I am a project manager at the Coastal Conservancy working in the North Coast region and I've had the privilege of working with folks in the Humboldt Bay region uh, quite a bit on sea level rise adaptation, uh, both planning and implementation projects. Um, and uh, Alderon Laird will also be presenting today. We'll be kind of tag teaming back and forth. Alderon has worked in uh, the Humboldt Bay region in environmental planning and restoration for decades and has been really intimately involved in sea level rise adaptation planning in the region. So I'm going to get us started. Uh, here's an outline of what we're going to be talking about today. And I will jump right into an introduction to the Humboldt Bay region. So Humboldt Bay is up in the uh, northern part of the state. Um, it is the largest protected body of water between San Francisco and the Puget Sound and the only deep water port between San Francisco and Coos Bay. Uh, when you're talking about sea level rise adaptation, it's important to be thinking about sediment because that's an important resource for marshes and mudflats to keep up with sea level rise through accretion and other processes. So when I think about Humboldt Bay, I'm also thinking about uh, the Eel River, uh, which is just south of the bay, you can see uh, it's about 10 miles down the shore. You can see all that sediment coming out of the Eel River and the delta there. And uh, some of that sediment makes its way north with the uh, prevailing currents during part of the year and into Humboldt Bay and is a major source of sediment for Humboldt Bay. Um, Humboldt Bay has three kind of sub bays. Uh, the northernmost is uh, Arcata Bay or North Bay. And then Entrance Bay is by the um, entrance channel here. Um, and then South Bay is a less developed part of, of Humboldt Bay, generally speaking. Um, you can see the major population centers are the city of Eureka and the city of Arcata, and the population of the region is about 80,000. So one of the things that makes Humboldt Bay unique in terms of sea level rise uh, adaptation is that it's facing the highest relative sea level rise rate on the west coast. Um, and when I say relative sea level rise rate, I'm talking about a combination of global sea level rise, um, just what the water is doing uh, globally or in the region, um, combined with what the land is doing. And in Humboldt Bay, there is significant tectonic vertical land motion. It's in the Cascadia subduction zone uh, near the junction of three of uh, tectonic plates. And as those plates move uh, against each other and under each other, uh, parts of the land are uplifted and other parts are uh, subsiding. Um, and this varies quite a bit across the region. So if you go about 70 miles north of, of Humboldt Bay to Crescent City, that area is being uplifted so much so that it's actually seeing negative relative sea level rise. So it looks like the sea level is dropping in Crescent City for the time being, although that's likely to change as sea level rise accelerates. But in Humboldt Bay, the land is dropping, um, and that results in a local sea level rise rate that's two to three times the long-term global rate. Here's a figure that illustrates that uh, a little bit more specifically. The blue line in this figure shows the trend for uh, local sea level rise or relative sea level rise at uh, the North Spit tide gauge in Humboldt Bay. Uh, the black line is regional sea level rise uh, for the West Coast. And then the red line is a measurement of kind of global mean sea level rise um, over the long term. And uh, you can see that the local sea level rise is significantly higher than regional sea level rise in this figure. And uh, you can also see from these numbers at the bottom of the slide that that uh, sea level rise actually varies across Humboldt Bay from the north to the south. So, so uh, these, these numbers are from uh, 
a recent uh, paper by Patton et al., um, uh, Cascadia Geosciences, and um, it, it used some uh, historic tide gauges with fairly short records of only about 30 years that you couldn't usually rely on for calculating sea level rise, along with benchmark level surveys and GPS data to estimate local sea level rise. And you can see at the North Spit tide gauge, that number came out around 4.6 millimeters per year, and it's at, up at 5.8 in the south end of the bay, so quite a bit higher. And this is all compared with around 2.3 for regional sea level rise rate for the West Coast. So it's a, it's a real challenge in Humboldt Bay. The same kind of changes you're seeing elsewhere, but coming a lot more quickly. Um, another, <coughs> excuse me, another feature of Humboldt Bay that's unusual and is both an opportunity and a challenge for sea level rise adaptation is the extensive diked tidelands around the bay. So this figure shows you in orange uh, the historic extent of tidal marsh in Humboldt Bay here to the north, and then this is the Eel River estuary on the south end. And the yellow shows you where uh, tidal marsh is currently. Um, most of those historic tidal marshes were diked and drained for agriculture and are currently used for uh, livestock grazing. So that's an opportunity in a sense, but it's also a challenge. Um, here's an image of a uh, typical diked historic tideland being used for livestock grazing. Um, and as you can see, it's open space. It does have some infrastructure associated with it. There's a lot of underground utility corridors and transportation corridors that cross these uh, historic tidelands. But generally speaking, uh, there's not a lot of infrastructure on them. So if you were looking for a place for managed retreat, you might think this would be a great opportunity. Uh, on the other hand, um, when these areas were diked and drained, they subsided significantly in elevation, more so than just the tectonic motion we were talking about. But as a result of uh, the livestock, uh, there was compaction of the surface of the, of, the, uh, of the marsh, and the organics in the marsh also oxidized once it was no longer being inundated regularly. So that's all resulted in a subsidence of up to about three feet. So a lot of these diked historic tidelines are now three feet below sea level. So if you allow them to be inundated, they won't be a place for marshes to migrate upslope to. You're not going to maintain marsh habitat here. They're going to convert to mudflats for the most part or subtidal habitats unless you import a whole heck of a lot of sediment and are able to raise the elevation to where marsh vegetation could be supported on them. Um, and this just kind of illustrates that point. Uh, it's a simple figure. Um, I think Alderaan prepared this actually, showing um, at current sea levels, if you were to breach the dikes around Humboldt Bay, um, where would uh, <coughs> natural habitats go just based on the elevation where you find those habitats? So it's, I'd say it's a simplified figure because we're showing habitats also in developed areas, like Arcata has marsh all over it in this figure. But just uh, illustrates the idea that um, you would get some salt marsh uh, migrating upslope, particularly down here in the Elk River area, but uh, you would also get just a lot of mud flat in these dike historic tide tidelands in the North Bay and also uh, especially in the South Bay. Um, another feature of the region that uh, is kind of an advantage for sea level rise adaptation planning is that it's a relatively small community um, with a manageable number of agencies to work with. And this slide doesn't really give that impression, I guess, because um, it does have 22 agencies listed on it. This is the Adaptation Planning Working Group that met regularly during the um, preparation of the Regional Adaptation Plan a few years ago. Um, but uh, it's really quite a smaller number of agencies than you would find in San Francisco Bay, for example, or even in a place like Monterey Bay. And there's a smaller subgroup that was really the core of this adaptation planning working group. Those are the entities that have to actually incorporate sea level rise into their, into their plans, uh, their land management plans. So Humboldt County, the city of Eureka, and Arcata that Alderaan will be talking about later in the presentation that have to prepare local coastal programs that will really incorporate uh, sea level rise. Um, and then another uh, handful of agencies that own a large amount of the land around the bay and have to manage that land, like the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Humboldt Bay National Wildlife Refuge. 
So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Alderon for the uh, to tell us about the adaptation planning process. Thank you, Joel. Can everybody hear me? Are you able to hear me, Joel? I can't really tell you if they can or not. I'm going to mute but myself. You can. Okay. Well, um, I wanted to start off by uh, highlighting uh, some findings that we've uh, made uh, doing the vulnerability assessment on Humboldt Bay over the last eight years or so. And there's really two issues um, at play on Humboldt Bay. One is the existing vulnerabilities uh, of the bay to current tidal uh, regimes, and the other is future risks as a result of sea level rise. And what you're looking at here is the Weat Tribes World Renewal Ceremonial Site during a King Tide event, which illustrates what one to one and a half feet of sea level rise might look like. So if we could go to the next slide then. Joel, could you go to the next slide? Second, I'm trying, but it's not advancing. Oh, okay. Oh, I think I'm, hold on a second. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Okay, so if, uh, taking the historical context, looking at Humboldt Bay, uh, essentially 60% was open water and mudflat and 40% was uh, salt marsh. The blue boundary that you can see was the natural shoreline was about 60 miles long. And if we go to the next slide. This is uh, the current uh, makeup of Humboldt Bay. The open water and mudflat, it's still about 15,000 acres, but now it's 90% of the bay's footprint and we've lost uh, about 90% of uh, the salt marsh that used to occur. But now the present day boundary is red and green. The red is artificial structures and the green is uh, natural shoreline. And the shoreline has increased to 102 miles, 75% of which is artificial structures a good portion of those are uh, barrier type structures that need to be maintained if we're going to prevent the tidal inundations of the, the former tidal areas behind them. You can go to the next slide. In uh, the, the first project on Humboldt Bay was a shoreline uh, mapping exercise and vulnerability assessment. And we mapped the type of structures that the shoreline was made of. And here you can see uh, the variety of structures. The dominant structure we found is that 41 miles uh, of earthen dikes that were constructed over a century ago, starting in 1890, followed by a railroad grade that was built in around 1903 to 1910 that occupies 11 miles, and then some road and fill uh, areas. But predominantly, the artificial shoreline is, um, is earthen dikes. And so if you can go to the next slide. We uh, used the LIDAR that was available back in 2012, and we created a shoreline profile so that we could determine the relative elevation of the existing shoreline to the mean monthly high water, and we used that as our tidal base level uh, to uh, track uh, effects of sea level rise. So in the next slide. In, in doing the vulnerability assessment, we identified all those shoreline segments that were actively eroding and all those shoreline segments that were within two feet of, of uh, the mean monthly high tide elevation uh, that could be overtopped with uh, teen tide and storm events and uh, just a, a minor amount of sea level rise, such as a foot. And so you can see the distribution of the areas that are at risk. Uh, which is in red, uh, and then yellow is, is a moderate. They're two to four feet above uh, the, the base elevation. And then the, the green areas are uh, low vulnerability. But this will play out uh, later on in the findings that we'll discuss on, in, going forward. Next one, Joel. And so there's been a number of, of efforts that have uh, been in, uh, in play on Humboldt Bay. The first one was the shoreline mapping and assessment. Vertical land motion trend analysis done by Cascadia Geosciences, as Joel mentioned, and combining that with uh, local sea level rise projections that were developed to take into account the vertical land motion and regional um, elevation changes. And we use those projections, the scenario based high projections for all of the work on Humboldt Bay. Uh, Northern Hydro Hydrology and Engineering developed a hydrodynamic model of the bay, a three dimensional model, and generated inundation maps for us based on half meter water elevation changes, um, starting with our mean annual maximum water elevation or king tide water elevation. 
We also had a limited groundwater analysis done of some of the dike former tideland areas on North Bay. And then as Joel mentioned, we convened a regional adaptation planning working group of all of the stakeholders um, connected to the bay so that we could explore the vulnerability of the bay and types of adaptation strategies that would be suitable. Caltrans in District 1 did a climate change pilot study where they focused on the Arcata Bay and the sea level rise implications. And then the, the Coastal Conservancy, uh, Coastal Commission, and OPC have all helped fund local coastal program vulnerability assessments, which have been completed. And uh, we are now engaged in doing local coastal program adaptation policy updates. So those are all the steps that have uh, occurred so far today. Joel, if you could go to the next one. And the hydrodynamic modeling that was done specific to the bay has really helped us identify where the inundation areas um, might be for each of the incremental water elevation changes as measured at the north spit and then propagated out throughout the bay. And if we go to the next slide. Joel, the next slide. Oh, I advanced it to the next slide. Are you not seeing the next slide? No, it's okay, there it is now. And so what we found with uh, the vulnerability assessments and based on the, the modeling and the inundation mapping is that if the current uh, shoreline, uh, that predominantly the dike shoreline, if that were to be compromised, then the, the mean annual maximum water elevation or our king tides would inundate the area that's depicted in blue. It would essentially reoccupy uh, the former tide lanes that were diked off starting in the 1890s. If we looked at what areas would be inundated with two meters of sea level rise, the additional inundation footprint is the area that's in red. And you can see that that would uh, occupy uh, the city of Eureka's urban waterfront and uh, other areas that weren't former tide lanes. But the dominant uh, influence that we have on Humboldt Bay is the historical legacy of the diking. And so we can see that sea level rise really doesn't expand the uh, inundation footprint tremendously. It will increase the depth of inundation though. We can go to the next slide. And to illustrate that, here's the mean high water uh, under current conditions uh, with the dikes intact. And if you go to the next slide, and this is the area that would be inundated today under mean high water. Um, if the dikes fail, and you could see that it would have a tremendous impact on the Highway 101 corridor, it would get, essentially become a causeway. And this is just, uh, this is not an uh, implications of sea level rise. This is uh, a result of the historical legacy of diking off these former tidelands and then building infrastructure on them. So if we go to the next slide. What we uh, learned in doing the vulnerability assessments on Humboldt Bay um, is that there's actually a threshold based on the barrier type uh, shoreline structures that with two feet of sea level rise above uh, the mean monthly high tide elevation, which is our baseline, 11 miles of the dikes or 27% of the dikes would be overtopped. Um, and that's the illustration on the left. When we write that rises to three feet, then 23 miles are, are at risk of being overtopped or 50 per six percent of the dikes. And that would affect all 23 hydrologic units that are dike shoreline units. And it's important to note that two feet of sea level rise, we nearly had that uh, occur during 2005 with the New Year's Eve storm and king tides. It was about 1.9 feet in elevation change. And the governor declared a state of disaster on Humboldt Bay with that 2005 event. And that's just two feet of sea level rise. One foot of sea level rise projected by say 2030 or 2040 add on a king tide event, we will be at that two foot threshold. So that's a significant tipping point that we uh, uncovered on Humboldt Bay and it affects our adaptation strategies going forward. So all the next one. And so the Humboldt Bay area plan of the counties um, is a uh, vulnerability assessment that was just completed in uh, 2018. And if you go to the next slide, 
uh, the county also did a couple of focused vulnerability assessments, one specifically looking at the Jet Dyke shoreline and inventorying all the assets that are protected by the Dyke shoreline on Humboldt Bay. And the other was looking at communities at risk in the, the county's jurisdiction. There's four communities at risk of uh, being tidally inundated. Um, and those were two of the more significant findings from that uh, vulnerability assessment. If you go to the next slide. The Dyke shoreline is uh, definitely uh, one of the diamond uh, features in the county's jurisdiction. Um, if the dikes breach, uh, this is a breach that occurred last King Tide season in, uh, down in South Bay. And you can see on the right, the dike former tidelands are quite a bit lower in elevation than the bay is at today. We go to the next slide. Um, County's vulnerability assessment also realized that the majority of all the dike former tidelands are in the county's jurisdiction. And while they're at risk of tidal inundation if the shoreline structure were to be breached, uh, we can reinforce and, and enhance uh, dike structures uh, to tolerate higher water elevations. But tied with changing water elevations from sea level rise is groundwater response. And the groundwater study that was done up in uh, North Bay uncovered that if you look at the uh, portion of the slide on the left, the area in blue is where groundwater becomes emergent water with one meter of sea level rise. And the area in red is where the groundwater is now within a meter of the surface. With two meters of sea level rise, you can see there's a quite a huge expansion of the emergent of groundwater. So even though we managed to maintain shoreline structures, ultimately the dike former tidelands behind those structures will be overcome with rising groundwater in response to sea level rise, which will affect all the assets that have been located on those lands. So it's not just uh, shoreline breaching and overtopping, but uh, uh, groundwater response to sea level rise that we're addressing. Next slide, Joe. And uh, looking at the communities at risk, this is a significant effect of sea level rise on Humboldt Bay. Here's uh, the community of King Salmon on the right and the uh, community of Fields Landing on the left. They're both west of Highway 101, just south of Eureka. Uh, with one meter of sea level rise, they're completely tidally inundated uh, based on their existing conditions. Their shorelines are compromised and overtopped, um, and there's nowhere for these communities to re retreat to. Um, there's not any areas that aren't developed that these areas, uh, these are unincorporated communities, so they're not organized municipalities. So relocation is really not a viable adaptation strategy in this instance. And so uh, the city held some workshops just recently with these communities to share uh, the results of the vulnerability assessment. Can you go to the next slide? The city of Eureka and the city of Arcata also completed uh, vulnerability and risk assessments. Um, so the entire bay now has been subject of a vulnerability assessment, all using the same uh, tidal inundation mapping products in the same shoreline inventory uh, products. So, Joel, can we go to the next one? And the city of Eureka's vulnerability assessments identified that it's uh, two municipal water transmission lines are located in those dike former tidelands, and the city does not own the shoreline structures that are protecting this critical piece of uh, infrastructure. And uh, the ability to maintain that infrastructure with rising sea levels, whether it's in response to rising groundwater or dikes breaching and the tidal inundations uh, in that mode, it's going to be very difficult uh, to maintain this type of infrastructure. And it's not going to be easy or cheap to try to relocate such structures. And go to the next one. The city of Arcata uh, vulnerability assessments highlighted the exposure of its wastewater treatment facility, which is out in the bay. And with one meter of sea level rise, um, it would be significantly surrounded and uh, compromised uh, with sea level rise. So the city, the majority of the urban developed portion of Arcata is not at risk, but all of the urban area of Arcata is dependent on a functional wastewater treatment facility. The next slide. And uh, Caltrans's vulnerability assessment highlighted the, you know, the exposure that the Highway 101 corridor uh, has as it traverses Arcata Bay. 
It fronting the highway is um, the North Coast Railroad Authority's railroad, uh, the Northwest Pacific Railroad grade. It hasn't been maintained in, in several decades and hasn't been used, but it is the shoreline that protects the highway, uh, but the Caltrans is not responsible for that railroad or maintaining that railroad. So if you could go to the next slide. And what we found in looking at the vulnerability of Highway 101, if we look at the shoreline vulnerability, the highway corridor is surrounded by the bay on one side and uh, tidal sloughs on the, on the back side. And the dikes on the tidal sloughs are vulnerable of being overtopped. And if you go to the next slide, if those uh, dike structures are overtopped, then Highway 101 with half a meter of sea level rise would be underwater, uh, both north and southbound lanes based on its present elevation. So the exposure of that uh, piece of infrastructure is pretty great. Um, it's not easy to rebuild that type of infrastructure. It takes quite a bit of lead time in planning and engineering and funding to be able to do that. So you can go to the next slide. And um, lastly, uh, the three local coastal program authorities are moving into the adaptation phase. Um, and uh, Humboldt County has developed a policy background study for its Humboldt Bay area plan. And uh, they are looking at adopting a sea level rise zone uh, for one meter inundation uh, footprint. Uh, they're also looking at uh, siting and development standards, um, real estate disclosures, um, looking at programmatic uh, permitting mechanisms to maintain and enhance shoreline structures and, and even exploring the feasibility of creating a shoreline district to maintain the shoreline structures. If we go to the next slide. And the city of Eureka has completed a couple of adaptation planning efforts. Um, and the city of Eureka has much more of an urban uh, exposure to sea level rise than Arcata or Humboldt County in the unincorporated area. Uh, the image on the left shows if we use the low projection, what is the inundation footprint? If we use the high projection, what would be the inundation footprint for 2100? And so the city's really grappling with is, um, you know, how far advanced do they want to project sea level rise uh, impacts uh, because the impact on its waterfront and its urban areas could be significant depending on how they go about doing it. The city also did a second uh, adaptation or an addendum um, to look at what how they could go about emphasizing protection as their their first line of defense for adaptation strategies and where they might apply that. Let's go to the next one, Joel. And I'm done. Okay, for now you're coming back later. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> thanks, Alderon. So I'll get. Uh, talk about a couple of research efforts ongoing uh, to do with sea level rise in the region and then a couple of implementation projects as well. So uh, first I'm going to tell you a little bit about a sediment dynamics research project. Um, as I was mentioning before, sediment is really important uh, in thinking about managing wetlands in the face of sea level rise. And so this project is funded by the EPA um, and it's uh, research being carried out by uh, researchers from the USGS, Jenny Curtis and Karen Thorne and uh, some other colleagues of theirs and from UCLA, uh, the Glenn McDonald Lab, looking at Humboldt Bay sediment dynamics. And the goal of the research is to understand whether marshes will be able to keep up with sea level rise now and under future climate change scenarios. Um, so this figure that we're looking at uh, is just kind of uh, a making the point, it's kind of communicating some bad news about accretion and elevation change of marshes and sea level rise. Um, and this is preliminary results. We have two years of data now. We have funding for two more years and there's still QA, QC going on, but um, just wanted to share some of these preliminary results with you. Um, these black lines here on the figure are showing uh, kind of the, the bookends for sea level rise, local sea level rise in Humboldt Bay. Uh, the lower uh, bar would be for the North Bay and the higher bar more for the South Bay. And then what you're seeing down here, are these green and orange bars. In orange, it's the sediment accretion at five different marshes, the first two in the South Bay and the other three in the North Bay. Um, so sediment accretion, just the, uh, 
the sediment that's depositing on those marshes and building up the marsh surface. Um, and then you have in green the net elevation change of the marsh surface. So uh, if you have a, a lower green bar, like the elevation of the marsh surface is less than the uh, sediment accretion, that's because there's something like decomposition of below ground biomass happening or compaction that is lowering the marsh surface. So that even though you have sediment depositing, the net change is less than, than what you would expect from the accretion. Um, and you might have a higher amount of elevation change if you have, for example, below ground biomass production going on. But the take home message from this is that whether you're looking at uh, sediment accretion or elevation change, which is really the relevant thing to look at, um, the marshes are not currently keeping up with sea level rise and sea level rise rates are just expected to accelerate. So uh, it's just a warning that as we might have thought, um, marshes around Humboldt Bay will be converting to mudflats and to lower elevation marshes over the next 70 to 100 years without any kind of management interventions. So uh, sharing some more preliminary findings from this research. Um, the first one I just discussed, uh, uh, in addition, um, it appears that there's a deficit of fine sediment. That's the sediment that would be really helping the marshes and mudflats build elevation. Um, and that deficit is due to dredging of the navigation channels and the other uh, marinas and other facilities around the bay, that material being dredged out and then exported outside of the Eureka littoral cell. So it's kind of lost to Humboldt Bay and to the littoral cell uh, because of the way it's disposed of. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, the good news uh, is that modeling shows that sediment supply will increase under future climate change scenarios, and that's probably due to more intense rainfall events. So that means there'll be more sediment to help marshes and mudflats keep up with sea level rise. On the other hand, uh, as everyone knows, we've been working to try to keep fine sediment out of our uh, streams for a long time. So there are other impacts to from turbidity to eelgrass and to other species. So. It's a mixed blessing. Um, and those findings, as I said, are still undergoing QA, QC, and are preliminary. But they highlight this key issue uh, of the importance of reusing dredge materials for marsh restoration, for sea level rise adaptation. And so the Conservancy and the Resources Agency and state parks and local partners have all worked together on plans and studies to try to facilitate that kind of beneficial reuse in Humboldt Bay. And we do have one 40-acre project that's uh, in its third or fourth year of implementation and is uh, bringing in a lot of sediment to restore dike to historic tideland. Some others that are in planning stages, those have been somewhat challenging just because of the logistics and the cost of moving sediment around and getting them to the restoration site. Um, a little bit more about dredge materials. Um, the beneficial reuse that we've been able to do so far mostly uh, is, is utilizing material that's uh, locally dredged by the Harbor District and the city of Eureka. And that's a real small number compared to the material that's dredged by the Army Corps of Engineers out of the navigation channels, which is more like 1.2 million cubic yards a year. That's taken out to the Humboldt Ocean Offshore Disposal Site outside the littoral cell and lost to the system. This just shows you that in a figure. You can see the Hood site out here. Uh, that's where sediment from dredging has been placed since 1990. Um, it's now full and uh, its expansion is being uh, permitted. Um, and as part of that uh, permitting, um, they're actually looking at uh, at least some pilot placement of sediment in this site off of the North Spit, the near shore demonstration site, which people have been talking about for a number of years now, but we're hopeful that there's going to be at least some initial placement of sediment here to keep that sediment in the littoral cell, and that could also help support the North Spit dune system, um, which is uh, right here and has shown in some areas uh, signs of erosion. Speaking of those dunes, uh, another area of research that the Conservancy and the Ocean Protection Council Sea Grant have been supporting is uh, looking at how the dune systems around Humboldt Bay will function uh, with sea level rise. The dunes are really important to protect the Hubble Bay from tsunamis and storms and uh, also provide really important wildlife habitat and have been a focus of native plant restoration efforts. You can see this image shows a beautiful wildflower display. That's what happens when you remove the uh, 
dominant invasive uh, European beach grass from the dunes and allow the native plants to come back. Um, so the study is looking at how the dunes have responded and are responding now to storms and uh, wave erosion, um, how they uh, are eroded and then build back up again, and then modeling how that response would work with sea level rise and identifying areas of the dune system that are vulnerable to breaching and to unraveling. And there has been a little of that occurring up there, particularly in the Eel River estuary, which has a, its own uh, dune system there, part of this coastal dune system. Um, there have been breaches there where the ocean has come in and uh, converted uh, pasture on the other side of the dunes to salt marsh. And so there are demonstration projects as part of the study to look at rebuilding those dunes and using large wood and native plants to try to stabilize and capture sand as, uh, to, to help keep the dunes intact. Um, now I'm going to talk about a couple of implementation projects, uh, and I'll jump right in with the Arcata Wastewater Treatment Plant uh, Living Shorelines Project. Um, this is located on the shoreline of the city of Arcata in the northeastern uh, part of Humboldt Bay, uh, Arcata Bay. And this wastewater treatment plant is uh, kind of a special uh, facility, one of the first, I think, in the country to use uh, marshes and um, ponds for tertiary wastewater treatment. So it provides uh, wildlife habitat and open space and recreation at the same time as it uh, cleans the city's wastewater to a higher standard. You can see it's right here on the bay, kind of sticking out in a vulnerable position. And that's communicated even more so in this inundation map that shows a half a meter of sea level rise along with the mean maximum monthly uh, water level. Um, you can see that the oxidation ponds here um, of the wastewater treatment plant and the treatment marshes are inundated if the uh, breaches, if the dikes are breached um, at this elevation, as well as some low-lying uh, roads and development in the area. So the city made the determination that this is a critical piece of infrastructure. It's very expensive to relocate and replumb the wastewater system. So they're looking at protecting it in place, but they wanted an option that wouldn't just be a hard protection option. Um, so instead, they're looking at a living shoreline approach. And the idea there is that uh, you, you design a structure that will attenuate wave energy and reduce erosion, but at the same time will provide wildlife habitat. And uh, because it's going to be uh, at least partially a natural system, it can take advantage of some natural processes to help maintain itself, like sediment accretion. So you bring those three together and you get a living shoreline uh, project design. In developing that design, the city was really looking at the local conditions here, which are quite challenging um, because of a prevailing strong south wind and a long wave fetch. There's a lot of wave energy and erosion uh, at this site here. You can see there's salt marshes on either side, but not at the site of the wastewater treatment plant. However, there is a fringe marsh and mudflat band along the edge of the existing uh, rock levee around the wastewater treatment plant. So that was an indication that you might be able to uh, maintain, construct and maintain a living shoreline here. The city worked with Humboldt State University with engineering students there on uh, the initial conceptual designs. And they divided the project area into six sub areas, each with its own conditions in terms of erosion. and. Uh, tidal dis wastewater discharge and, and uh, um, so forth. And uh, the students worked with incorporating natural uh, materials like oyster reefs uh, to encourage uh, uh, native oyster uh, colonization on, on structures in the living shorelines, coir logs, large wood, um, and developed some initial conceptual designs looking at building out marshes along the levee or creating these kind of uh, uh, step pools uh, with oyster reef and sediment logs with uh, kind of mudflat in between. Um, and they uh, estimated cost and wave height attenuation for each of these different approaches. The city took those conceptual designs and uh, developed a subset of them to a um, uh, greater degree of engineering for permit level review. Um, and you can see uh, they, they 
developed those for four different sites around um, the uh, wastewater treatment plant and some additional uh, sites for large woody debris placement that are indicated by these little black dots here. Um, here's a closer look at uh, one of those designs. So this is, you can see it's pretty small pilot, pilot uh, implementation at first, just about 30 feet out into the bay and 100 feet wide. And it's got oyster shell and coir log at the bottom of the slope here to kind of stabilize the structure and then uh, sediment in the middle and a willow waddle further up for an additional kind of level of stabilization and then some large wood placed along the existing marsh vegetation as well. So uh, that's in permit review now and the city's hoping to move forward with that uh, possibly as early as, as this uh, summer. Um, I wanted to just step back and say that the city has been very committed to habitat restoration generally and to uh, trying to keep development out of harm's way um, and take advantage of restoring marshes and wetlands to get the protection that those uh, systems provide along most of its shoreline. But as I said before, with the wastewater treatment plant, this critical piece of infrastructure, expensive to relocate, they decided to try to protect it in place and to do that with a living shorelines approach to have some habitat benefits as well. Um, let me uh, tell you a little bit about another project. This is the Elk River Estuary Restoration Project um, in Entrance Bay. This is more of a traditional tidal marsh restoration project, but one that has some features uh, added to it um, with sea level rise in mind. Um, so you can see it's uh, almost opposite the entrance channel to Humboldt Bay, a little south of the city of Eureka. The city of Eureka owns the land and they're the project proponent. Um, and the project area is uh, to the north and south of the Elk River, uh, which comes out here along the Elk River spit. It's about 100 acres. Um, you can see this area is vulnerable to, to inundation with sea level rise. This is assuming a, a tidal elevation of, of about 10 feet, so which is just mean maximum monthly water plus 100 year still water level. And at that uh, amount, uh, at that water level, you can see that Highway 101, which runs along this, the, the uh, east side of the project area, is already starting to get inundated in sections. Um, there's also a power line along Highway 101 here, and there's a wastewater transmission line on the west side of the project. So both of those facilities are also very vulnerable to inundation. So as I mentioned, this is uh, in some ways a traditional tidal marsh restoration project. It's going to involve um, restoring tidal prism by uh, breaching the dikes are removing a tide gate here on the north side and excavating a primary and secondary tidal channel system to restore tidal marsh and some riparian where the elevation is right as well. But it also has some additional features. One of those is the tidal ridge that will be constructed. That's this linear tan feature that you see along both edges, especially here in the southern section. Um, and that's going to be a gently sloping berm, uh, which will support wetland vegetation up to about nine feet, but we'll have a top level of 12 feet here on the west and 14 feet on the east. And that will provide additional protection from erosion uh, for the highway embankment and for the power line along the highway, and then also for the wastewater transmission line, which will be replaced and uh, put at this higher elevation along the west side of the project. Um, here's a picture of the current conditions on the north part of the project area, north of the Elk River. So this is a, a currently a, a brackish marsh with uh, dominated by invasive Spartina, invasive cord grass. Um, and the reason you have marsh conditions there, even though you have this tide gate, is that the tide gate is leaky. So you have the right salinities to support marsh vegetation and you have a lower elevation because of the, some of the subsidence that's gone on here. But what you don't have is any sediment accretion going on to help this marsh keep up with sea level rise. And that's a real lost opportunity, especially here on the Elk River, which is one of the most sediment heavy systems in Humboldt Bay. It has a lot of sediment coming down this river. So part of the project is going to involve removing these tide gates and allowing uh, excavating tidal channels into this northern section, removing this invasive cord grass but allowing for accretion to uh, take place again to help this 
marsh to keep up with sea level rise for longer. Um, the southern part of the project area is currently a livestock pasture, um, but unlike a lot of the dike historic tidelands, it's not uh, three feet below sea level. It's at a higher elevation, so we don't have to import large amounts of sediment to uh, get it to an elevation that will support marsh vegetation. We will be using both here and on the north uh, part of the project area uh, quite a bit of sediment from the channel excavation uh, to create a sloping marsh plain. So all that sediment is going to be kept on the site, and in addition to constructing those tidal ridges, we'll be able to create these gently sloping marsh plains with uh, a significant amount of high marsh area that will allow for some upslope marsh migration and allow marsh to persist longer um, in the project area, as well as reducing costs because we're not going to have to haul sediment off to another area. Um, so the status of that project, uh, it's got its permits, it's trying to secure its final funding and hoping to start construction in summer 2019. <coughs> I'll just briefly mention uh, another project in the feasibility study stage, which is looking at uh, living shorelines along Highway 101. This is an area that Alderon was showing images of earlier in the presentation that's uh, vulnerable to inundation, sea level rise, and where the railroad embankment has significantly eroded. Um, the county is working on uh, construction of, the, of a multi-use trail from Arcata to Eureka, it's partially completed, um, but that's gonna be west of the highway. And so as part of that project, they're looking at how are we gonna protect that trail and how are we gonna protect Highway 101 at the same time. And so they're evaluating the feasibility of constructing a living shoreline marsh on the bay side of the highway, or the trail would be on top of that uh, uh, sediment that would be placed there. So with that, um, let me hand it back to Alderon for the final part of the presentation. Thank you, Joel. I'll uh, try to go through this quickly, and we're running out of time a little bit, but we wanted to highlight some of uh, the challenges in, to adaptation planning on Humboldt Bay. And uh, all of the vulnerability assessment work that's been done to date on Humboldt Bay is used uh, scenario-based uh, sea level rise projections, specifically the high projection, and the Ocean Protection Council and I believe the Coastal Commission have adopted new sea level rise projections that are based on probabilistic projections and risk aversion um, levels. And those rates are different than what we have used. The, the medium to high risk aversion rates are about half a foot um, higher than what we used for 2050 and about two feet higher than what we used for 2100. But um, these new sea level rise rates uh, introduce an extreme risk aversion rate. And if we look at those, they're two to three, um, if we look at the two to three foot threshold on Humboldt Bay that's so critical, uh, we're gonna reach that two foot uh, threshold uh, instead of in 2050, it could be as early as 2050 and for the three-foot threshold, instead of being 2070, it could now be 2050. So everything is moving up um, uh, much sooner uh, than what we had been originally planning. So we just have to start moving all that much quicker on it. But um, we are not redoing the vulnerability assessments. All the assessments are really based on a water level that will be achieved uh, rather than relying on the projection of when that water level is going to be achieved. If we go to the next slide. And the other issue that we're dealing with on Humboldt Bay uh, may be somewhat uh, um, unique for Humboldt Bay is all the dike former tidelands on Humboldt Bay are state retained jurisdictional lands under the Coastal Act. And those are the areas that you see in blue. 75% of the inundation footprint uh, on Humboldt Bay for one and a half meters is in the state retained jurisdiction, not in the local coastal program jurisdiction. That jurisdiction, those jurisdictions are highlighted in yellow. In fact, almost nearly the entire shoreline of Humboldt Bay is in state retained jurisdiction. So how we go forward with developing adaptation strategies and their implementation is going to require integration between the LCP authorities of the two cities and the county and the Coastal Commission uh, who will be relying on Chapter 3 of the Coastal Act. So, um, even though the authorities are developing adaptation policies, 
their application will not be automatic and on the state retained jurisdictional areas their development will be restricted or reviewed based on chapter three so this is a problem of uh, coordination and integration that we're going to have to resolve if you go to the last slide or next to the last slide the other issue that we're finding is, is many of the critical assets on Humble Bay, uh, such as all of our power generating facilities, as well as the spent nuclear fuel storage site, uh, but um, other um, critical utilities and transportation uh, infrastructures aren't owned by the local governments or the LCP authorities. And they don't really have the ability through the lack of ownership to uh, to cause the utility infrastructures uh, to implement adaptation measures, whether it's for energy or communications, or to necessarily leverage Caltrans on what to do with uh, their transportation priorities for uh, adapting to sea level rise. Um, and the county is not even involved with the delivery of municipal water or wastewater treatment. And so um, it does, the capacity of local governments is relatively limited when it comes to actually implementing uh, adaptation strategy. It's really going to require a private and public uh, collaboration and partnership between uh, land use authorities, asset owners, um, and uh, other agencies such as uh, Caltrans if we're going to move this forward in a coordinated regional manner rather than uh, uh, isolated LCPs each going in their own different directions with not the ability to implement some of the measures because of the lack of ownership. And so those are three challenges that we're facing on Humboldt Bay. I'm sure others are facing similar uh, challenges uh, in other regions of California. And with that, can you go to the last one, Joel? And Joel and I would like to thank all of you for um, uh, listening in on this webinar today. Thanks, everybody. Um, so we do have just a few minutes. Uh, left, we can look at uh, some of the questions that people might have asked. Um, let's see if I can open this up. Um, there we go. Uh, all right. So um, the first question we have here uh, from Doug George is how can state parks be involved in the adaptation planning group? Um, and uh, I think we can definitely notify state parks about meetings going forward. I think probably the reason that um, state parks hasn't been that involved in the, uh, till the present just for the Humboldt, Humboldt Bay itself is because uh, the, the um, facilities that state parks has right around Humboldt Bay are limited to this historic uh, Fort Humboldt um, site, which is uh, not really within the immediate zone that's looking at planning just based on its elevation. Um, but there's definitely, of course, uh, you know, in the wider North Coast region, a lot of important um, parks and, and lands that are managed by state parks. And so certainly it would be good to involve them. Aldron, did you have anything to add on, on that one? Yeah, the, you know, the state parks, the lagoons, you know, uh, north of Humboldt Bay, those are all very much uh, vulnerable landscapes uh, that are at risk from sea level rise and whatever type of strategy we explore on Humboldt Bay would be applicable on those lagoons going north all the way up to Lake Earl. Right, yeah. Um, let me go on to the next question. Um, so uh, here's a question from Marin County's Jack Leapster asking about uh, groundwater um, and uh, thinking about are there some general approaches to systematically assess the contribution of uh, groundwater to sea level rise problem challenges and what kind of adaptation measures might be available. Um, just to take a stab at that, I, I uh, believe that there's a project underway now that's doing some general kind of groundwater modeling, groundwater response to sea level rise modeling for the North Coast. Uh, together with expanding the Cosmos model up the North Coast. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that should, I, I don't really know the specifics of, of that, but I think that's, uh, there is some kind of groundwater modeling that's being applied very broadly across the state now that hopefully will will help give us some useful information. Did you have more on that, Alderon or Mary? Uh, 
Well, the the main thing with the lands that are vulnerable to the emerging groundwater are the dike former tidelands, and we're looking at maybe 9,000 acres. And uh, as Joel mentioned before, some of those areas have compacted two to three feet. So we're talking an awful lot of fill material that would be needed to be brought in in order to raise the surface elevations to stay above the rising groundwater. Um, and that's in a mostly an urban landscape, um, and it would depend on whether or not that would make the utilities, underground utilities, more resilient to sea level rise, because they're probably already saturated by groundwater and saltwater intrusion. Okay, let's look at the next question, also from Jack. Are there reports available on the projected impact slash erosion of the Humboldt dunes with the sea level rise? So, um, there, there, you know, this Climate Ready grant, there have been progress reports that the uh, that this Dunes research project has been making available. I believe they're on the Friends of the Dunes website, and I can look into that and make that uh, available in, in notes for this uh, presentation. I think we're going to make the whole presentation available as a PDF on the website, and we'll add some notes to it to try to uh, provide some information about that. Um, sorry, go ahead, Alder. I think their most recent report that just came out a month or two ago is the one that contains all of those cross-sectional data. Uh -huh. so okay, that and that's on, I think that's on the Friends of the Dunes website. That's the nonprofit that has been yes. administering the Conservancy grant. Uh, let's see, we have a question from Laura Brophy. Does the interface provide a viewable list of those participating in the webinar? Um, that's beyond my technical capability so. <laughs> to answer, but Mary doesn't think so. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, Laura is also sharing some resources on two assessments recently completed for all estuaries on Oregon's outer coast. Mapping and analysis of sea level rise impacts the tidal wetlands and uh, mapping and analysis of infrastructure vulnerability for the same estuaries. And she provides websites so we can uh, make that available to people as well um, and send that out uh, or include that with the, with the presentation, um, looking at that sea level rise analysis for estuaries on Oregon's outer coast. We'll, we'll send that out to everybody. Um, let's see, what else do we get, have we got here? Uh, another question from Jack about the um, jurisdictional questions saying, aren't former tidelands under the jurisdiction of the State Lands Commission if they articulated their policies relative to adaptation? Um, on I believe, Humble Bay, uh, they Alder, were, what would you, have you talked to the State Lands Commission about adaptation planning? Well, on Humboldt Bay, all the uh, former tidelands or the bay lands have all been granted to the Humboldt Bay Harbor District for uh, management. So the State Lands Commission doesn't manage the lands waterward of mean higher high water. The former dike tide lands are still covered by the public trust easement and would be subject to the state lands commission, at least for development and leases. But I'm not aware of them specifically looking into sea level rise on Humboldt Bay. They do have a requirement for ports and harbors to do a sea level rise vulnerability assessment by July of 2019, I believe. Yeah, but that's an interesting point that uh, it, it could be a good idea to engage with them. Yep. Um, let's see, do we have time for, I think we're about out of time. Um, we have one last question we'll just squeeze in here, um, although it is one o'clock and that's from Dave Ravel. What has been the local jurisdiction's acceptance and willingness to consider managed retreat? Um, and uh, Alderon could probably speak to that better than me. I would say it's been somewhat mixed, and I think there's an understandable inclination when we're talking about, depending on the facility, but when you have residential areas, certainly people want to be able to keep their property as long as they can and live in it. But, you know, it's interesting. I was at a um, meeting at King, for King Salmon residents. That's one of those communities at risk that Alderon was talking about. And folks were saying, you know, I do want to keep living in my house as long as I can, but if I, I don't want to destroy the bay in order to maintain my property. So they recognized that they weren't going to be able to do that forever and that ultimately they were going to have to look at retreat there. Um, so I think generally there's, you know, there's a, it's a sort of a mixed bag. And 
of course, dependent on, on what you're talking about in terms of the facility. Alderman, what would you say about that question? I would say the three LCP authorities want to pursue protection strategies for the, at least for the first 50 years going forward. Um, I think managed retreat is, is a concept, but um, until they exhaust the opportunities for protection, I think that they want to pursue those. And there's a limited footprint in Humboldt Bay region to retreat um, just because of the topography. Right, okay, great. Thanks, Alderon. So um, uh, just one more note, then I'll say goodbye to everybody. Um, just Patrick Barnard did add a note for point of information. Through recent OPC funding, USGS will apply Cosmos to the entire North Coast, thereby, add, thereby adding the storm component to the current sea level rise work. That's right, the, the current sea level rise assessment has been based on still water analysis and also adding in groundwater impacts for the entire state. So that's great that that work is happening and thanks for sharing that, Patrick. So with that, I just wanna thank everyone for attending. We will send out information about the, uh, you know, send out the, the link to the presentation with notes and resources and uh, let people know about upcoming presentations, but we're uh, really glad that folks uh, were here today to listen to this uh, presentation and look forward to uh, being in touch more soon. Have a good one. Thank you.